Hello, good afternoon. We're pleased to be out in the street again. We're here from Partick Free Church of Scotland, continuing. And we're delighted to be able to use this glorious day that the Lord has given to us in order that we might come out and preach the Christian gospel to you. Maybe as you're having your lunch, taking a break from your office, or maybe as you're shopping, or maybe as you're going from one place to another, traveling. Whatever we do, pray that as you come under the sound of the gospel, that it might bear fruit in your lives, and that you might be, uh, maybe for the first time, confronted with the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do live in a time and an age when there is much confusion and ignorance regarding the Christian gospel. And that's why we take this time and this opportunity to come out to dr draw your attention to the basic elements of Christianity. And basically Christianity is about a person. It's not about rules and regulations. It is about a person. What one person has done and that person, of course, is none other than the eternally begotten Son of God, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And Christianity is a record of what God has done in Christ. And as I stand here, I can see some people shaking their heads, but Really, this is the most important and vital message that could possibly uh, be given to mankind. Because in the Christian gospel, our greatest need is fully addressed. Our greatest need, friends, is to be reconciled to God. It is to have our sins forgiven. It is to know that when we pass into eternity that we shall go to be with Christ, we shall go to heaven. And really the things that we're drawing to your attention this afternoon are the most vital things that you could ever possibly consider. And therefore we have people out here and they're handing out gospel tracts. We would be pleased if you would take one Maybe you haven't got time at the moment to read it, but put it in your pocket and when you get time, maybe over a cup of coffee or as you're traveling, you might be able to read something. And there you will find a good, sincere gospel message to you. Again, highlighting our great problem and also leading you and guiding you and directing you to God's solution and God's answer to our greatest plight and our greatest need. And maybe now this afternoon as you're hearing one or two of these things that I'm saying, you might well begin to wonder what indeed is uh, my greatest need that the preacher's hinting upon. What is my greatest need? Maybe you're saying to yourself that your greatest need is that you might have more money or you might have a, a different job, or maybe you might have a, a different or a better spouse or partner, or maybe you're looking for a, a new home. There may be many things that are pressing upon your minds, and these things obviously are important, and they have their place in our lives. But there is one overriding thing that is vitally important for us to consider, and it is our relationship with our Creator. It is our relationship with the Lord our God, the great Creator, the one who made all things. As the Bible declares, it's not, it's not afraid to tell the truth, and however much the truth is despised today, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that God is the Creator. The very first verse of the first book in the Bible Read it for yourselves if you have a Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. 
You will notice there, if you, if you read that verse, or if you're listening to me speaking here, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You notice there's no apology. You notice there's no defense. You notice that the Bible does not try to prove the existence of God. It assumes the existence of God. And indeed, this is our standard position. This is what it is for mankind. Every single individual, regardless of what they might articulate and say, every single individual knows that God exists. And not simply that a God exists, but the God of the Bible exists. If you look at Romans chapter 1, that's in the New Testament, there the Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear that God has left us without an excuse. For God has revealed himself externally, and he has revealed himself internally. And you may well wonder, where do we get that in the Bible? Well, if we turn to Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 1, there we read the Apostle Paul, in verse 19 of chapter 1, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. And in that verse there, the Apostle Paul is telling us and telling those whom he originally wrote the letter to that God has revealed himself externally. And you may well ask me then, minister, where has God revealed himself externally? Well, you just have to look at the creation. You just have to look at what has been created. And as you will understand, and you will know, nothing can come from nothing. And therefore, we have a problem because we have something. What is that something? The something is creation. And creation is, in some sense, a sermon. It is telling us about the reality of God and as we look at creation, and by the way, we can only see a very, very small part of creation. But the more that we look at creation, whether we look at it through a telescope or through a microscope, we see the handiwork of God. God's fingerprints are upon all of his creation. Look how complex it is. Look how detailed it is. Look how organized it is. Look how beautiful it is. And all of these things and much more are telling us clearly and plainly that some great glorious God has created all of these things. And the Bible teaches us that he created these things in six days. The work of creation is God's making all things by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good. That's what the Bible teaches. And therefore God has revealed himself externally so that we are without excuse. But also, God has also given us another witness. And where is that other witness? That other witness is within our own hearts and lives. It is our conscience. Where did you get your conscience from? Where do you get your conscience that tells you what is right and tells you what is wrong? Where did that come from? That did not evolve, as the evolutionists will tell us. That has been implanted in us because we are made in the image of God. God made man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge and righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures and therefore God has left his stamp upon you you have this sense a universal sense we might say of right and wrong it doesn't matter where you go you might go to the most civilized nation in the world or you might go to the most backward nation in the world and yet all of these people have the same conscience they have their own conscience that tells them what is right 
and what is wrong. We know it's wrong to murder. No. We know it's wrong to murder. We know that. Where do we know? How do we know that? Our conscience will tell us. And therefore, when the Bible says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, he doesn't, he doesn't try to prove the existence of God because you all know that God, that the God of the Bible truly exists. And this God is the one who has created all things. All things that we can see with our eyes. And all things that we cannot see. Like the spiritual world. There's another world round about us. There's a spiritual world. And God has created that world also. He is the only creator. And he is your creator. Originally he made Adam. He was the first man. Adam was made out of dust. Adam was made supernaturally by God. God formed him out of the dust. And afterwards, because Adam was lonely, what happened? God created Eve. He created Eve out of Adam. And these two are our first parents. And they are the first ones that God made. And he made them supernaturally. And all mankind has descended from our first parents, Adam and Eve. Now this is vitally important for us to grasp and to understand. Because Adam and Eve were created perfect. They were like their creator. They were without sin. And they enjoyed a wonderful relationship with their creator. But something happened that changed all of that. What was it? It was that sin came into the world. How did sin come into the world? Well, Eve was tempted by the evil one. The Lord God had given Adam a very clear and very precise commandment that he could eat from the fruit of all the trees in the Garden of Eden. But there was one he could not eat of. It was of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he was told, if he ate that fruit, he would die. The moment that he ate that fruit, he would die. Well, the evil one came and tempted Eve, and she saw that the fruit was good to look at, and she ate it. And she gave some to her husband, and he ate it. And since that time, friends, life has changed upon this earth, because sin entered into man's existence and experience. You may well say to me then, what is sin? What is sin? Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is not keeping God's law or breaking God's law. And that's what happened to our first parents. They were given a clear commandment and they broke it. Eve was deceived. Adam was disobedient. And from that time they died spiritually. What does that mean? Well, they lost communion. They lost fellowship. They lost that relationship that they had with their Creator. The moment that they sinned, they died spiritually. And they no longer had that special union and relationship that they did have with their Heavenly Father. And because we have all come from them, we have a problem. We have inherited their sinful nature. That's why the Bible tells us, not to flatter us, but to inform us and to tell us the truth, as it is in Jesus, that we are sinners. We are sinners by nature. And because we are sinners by nature, we sin and we commit sinful acts. Now, this is our great problem. This is the great difficulty that every single one of us faces. Does not the Bible say, again in Romans, this time in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
That's the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul as he's writing to the Romans. He's telling them the gospel that he proclaims. He has never personally met them. But he writes his letter to introduce himself to them. And he tells them the gospel. And part of the gospel is, for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what was true there 2,000 years ago as he was writing to the Romans is also true for us today. And as we're here on Buchanan Street in Glasgow this afternoon, whatever we're engaging in, no matter what we might be doing or who we are, the Bible tells us clearly, plainly, for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I put it to you this afternoon that this is our greatest problem. Every other problem is nothing in comparison with this. Because this problem separates us from our Creator. And if this problem is not addressed and dealt with to the satisfaction of our, our Maker, then for all eternity we shall be separated from the gracious presence of the living God. And therefore, what we're seeking to draw to your attention this afternoon is of vital importance. It's not to be dismissed lightly. You see all the problems that befall this world. You look at the problems maybe you have in your own family. We can see the problems that we have on the international scene. We have wars and rumors of wars. We have all kinds of problems. We have economic difficulties. We have energy problems that are coming upon us. Who knows where this war will escalate, whether we will get involved, whether NATO will expand, and whether Russia will re respond in, in, in response to what they perceive as NATO's aggression. You see these things just as well as I do. Where do all these things come from? Why have all these difficulties come to us? They all ultimately come from the great problem with mankind, which is sin, which has separated us from our Creator. But, and here's a wonderful and a glorious but, friends. Mankind's problem is great, and mankind doesn't have the desire, nor the inclination, nor the ability to deal with our greatest problem. Many people turn to religion, and b believe you me, there are multitudes of religions today, thousands and thousands of them, and the number is growing day after day. But, but they cannot deal with our great problem of sin. But God can, and God does, and God has. What's He done? He has sent forth His Son the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ did something that no one else could do. What did he do? He paid the price of sin. That's what he did. You see, we have to understand and we have to marvel and we have to glory in what Christ has done. He came to this world. He left heaven. He left glory behind. He came and veiled his glory. He took upon Himself our form and our nature. He became just like us. What does it say in Philippians? Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made Himself of no reputation, and took upon Him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. These verses, friends, are outlining the humiliation undertaken by the Lord Jesus, something that he did willingly and voluntarily. Why did he do it? He did it, friends, in order that he would be able to offer up his life, himself, as a once for all perfect sacrifice to satisfy the just demands of God's most holy and inflexible law. This may well be news to you this afternoon, but God is a holy God. 
and God cannot tolerate sin and God must deal with sin and therefore the only way that he could forgive sinners would be that someone would need to die in their room and in their place and this is why Christ came this is why he came he was miraculously conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary and this had to be the way that he would come because by this way he did not inherit original sin had he been conceived by ordinary generation he would have been a sinner just like every one of us but no the Son of God was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by a extraordinary action of God the Holy Spirit which guaranteed that he would be conceived without any original sin he would be sinless yet he would be he would have a human nature and therefore the Lord Jesus Christ is completely and utterly unique there is no individual like him he alone is the God man he is the mediator between God and man and that's why he came he had to be a man in order that he might suffer because as God he could never suffer and he had to be God otherwise he could not in any sense mediate between God and men and that's why we commend to you this afternoon the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who dealt with our greatest problem he dealt with the problem of our sin he did something that you and I could never do he satisfied God's just demands you see even his enemies acknowledged that he lived a perfect life when he came to Pilate I find no fault in him when he came to Herod and Herod judged him he said exactly the same there's no fault in him even Judas who betrayed the Lord Jesus when he realized what he did he said I have be betrayed innocent blood and the Lord Jesus Christ was the only person that ever lived a perfect life who did not sin who could not sin even in thought or word or in deed he lived an absolutely perfect life and therefore when he gave up himself as a sacrifice he was offering up a perfect sacrifice a perfect sacrifices that met God's most holy and inflexible standards and friends this is important for us because this afternoon as we're out here telling you something about the Lord Jesus we are telling you that you are to put your faith and your hope and your trust upon one who offered up a perfect sacrifice and we know that his sacrifice was accepted how do we know this how do we know it well he was taken down from the cross dead he was put in a tomb on the Friday evening he remained there until early Sunday the first day of the week but what happened on the first day of the week he arose he rose victorious over the grave I cannot take you this afternoon to Christ's tomb why not because he's not there he's not in a tomb he has risen and the very fact that he's risen demonstrates friends that his work was acceptable God would not raise to life a liar or an imposter no he rose because God accepted his work and therefore we're able to come out onto the street and to preach to all and sundry and to tell them that under God they are they are 
sinners, and under God they are under his wrath and curse. But the good news of the gospel is, if you will but turn and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as your Lord and Savior, you will have your sins forgiven. Yes, all of your sins can be forgiven. All you must do is come to the Lord Jesus. Come and believe upon him. Look upon him. Trust him for your salvation. Acknowledge that he is the only begotten Son of God. Acknowledge that he is the God-appointed Savior. Acknowledge there that he died in the room and place of sinners. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge the claims that he has made about himself. And trust him. The Lord Jesus began his public ministry by telling people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And after his death and his resurrection, and when he appeared unto his disciples and he commissioned them to go forth and to preach the gospel, they went forth with basically the same message, go forth, preach repentance, forgiveness of sins. And that's why we're out this afternoon. It's a pleasure and it's an awesome privilege to be able to come out onto the street and Buchanan Street and Glasgow the city this afternoon and to tell you something concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ because friends he is the only God appointed Savior he is the only one that can save you as I said earlier we know there are many many religions and all of them are telling you to do this and to do that and then ultimately you'll be right with God well Christianity is unique because Christianity is telling you that there is one who has come from heaven the Lord Jesus Christ and he has done everything in order to reconcile mankind to God and what you have to do is to believe upon him you're not asked to perform any religious duties you're not asked to do anything you're asked to believe believe in him that's what we say and we wonder why do people dismiss this this message is perfectly reasonable if you understand something of the of the holiness of the God who made us and formed us you would delight that there is a way of salvation and that's found only in the Lord Jesus Christ he himself did say again read this in your own Bibles don't take my word for it read it in John that's in the New Testament John chapter 14 verse 6 which says I am the way and the truth and the life no man cometh to the Father but by me these are the words of the Lord Jesus he himself says dogmatically clearly plainly I am the way and the truth and the life no man cometh to the Father but by me he is the way and that's why he came down to this world to make a way to create a way and that's what he did by taking upon himself our nature and becoming like us living a perfect life giving up his himself in a perfect sacrifice which satisfied God's just and holy demands and now we have a gospel to proclaim we have a wonderful hope for everyone there's no need to perish you know friends we cannot deny it and we will not hide it but the day will come when you'll go the way of all the earth you'll be gathered to your fathers we're all mortal we feel it more and more as each day goes by we know our weaknesses we know our frailties we know we're not as fit as we once were all these things are telling us that we are mortal and one day we will go the way of all the earth where will you go it's a very sobering question that's a question many people don't like to consider but you must it's truly like burying your head in the sand if you will not face this 
issue that faces every single one of us. Life can be very short. It can be very brief. Our lives can end very suddenly. Where are you going to go when you pass from the scene of time? The Bible tells us, friends, there are two places. After death, we will go to one of two places. Jesus is telling us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. In other words, you'll never go to heaven unless Jesus Christ takes you, unless you believe upon him. And the other place is that awful, that terrible place, the place the Bible calls hell. It's one of two places. Now can you see the urgency of what we are impressing upon you? This is the most vitally important issue that you can possibly comprehend and think upon. Where are you going to spend eternity? Well, in the gospel, we have a glorious hope. That hope is Jesus Christ. But you must partake of him. You must believe upon him. You must receive him for yourselves, friends. And that's why we come out this afternoon. We're from Partick, Free Church of Scotland, continuing. We meet at two Thornwood Terrace. That's just opposite the police station on Dumbarton Road. Go up the hill and you will first come to Thornwood Primary School. Then you will meet our building next door on the crossroads at two Thornwood Terrace. We will give you a warm welcome to come along on the Lord's Day Sunday at 11 a.m. and again in the early evening at 6 p.m. And we also have a midweek meeting at 7.30 on Wednesday to which you're all welcome and you would hear more concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. We're going to take a short break, but may God bless his word to you this afternoon.